Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Pretty good. Um, as you know, I've got a video clip I'm going to share with our uh, with our viewing audience, and I think it's pretty interesting. I think you 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 may disagree uh, as to how significant it is, but it's uh, it's a clip of Judy Miller, the famously controversial New York Times reporter, and I submit that it bears directly on the question of her motivation in choosing to spend some time in jail rather than uh, testify against Scooter Libby. Um, as you know, uh, some people have speculated that she was motivated by a partisan allegiance to Libby and Cheney and the policies of the uh, Bush administration and the war on terror and the Iraq war and so on. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, I admit it takes kind of a subtle read to... to uh, convince you maybe that it does corroborate that speculation, but I think it does, uh, and I'll be happy to guide your interpretation as necessary to convince you of that. She's on the Larry King show, um, and King, you'll see, just uh, this is a few weeks ago, it's right after the Jordan bombings, and King just asked what I think is a pretty innocent question, uh, are things going to, you know, is going to get worse or what, you know? I submit that she reacts in a, in a mildly... Uh, kind of defensive way and, and connects it to Bush's policies in a way that King didn't really intend. But you tell me if I'm getting uh, a little too uh, interpretive in my, in my uh, exegesis. Okay, here's a clip. Judith Miller with Al-Qaeda and all this, and we'll get back to some other things, but is it going to get worse? Well, worse than what? Worse than 2001, Larry? Uh, it's continued. But al-Qaeda, without a doubt, I think, has been significantly weakened by the international war on terrorism that has been uh, led by this administration. Okay, so there it is. Now, again, you have to pay pretty close attention, but, but uh, did you not see anything that I saw? Well, she's, a, she's sympathetic to the Bush administration and doesn't have a, uh, you know, a... a, a, a uh, what we would consider a sophisticated understanding of how the war on terror can feed into Al Qaeda. And, well, and I, no, it's, so, but it's, it's, so it's not. It's not the substance of her uh, of, of her elaboration or anything. I just think it's her interpreting a, a, an innocent and generic question as some kind of critique of Bush administration policy. She says, compared to what? Compared to 2001, Larry. I mean. She cl clearly wants to make the case that things have not gotten worse uh, on Bush's watch. I mean, I can imagine, I, I mean, if, if Cheney or Bush or Libby were being interviewed by King, they would naturally take the question that way, even if it was meant innocently, because their job is to, is to defend uh, their policies, which are clearly tied to this phenomenon. But I think it's, it's, str it's strange, and, and I think she also, she responds in a kind of a, a, a visceral way, well, I, I, I almost thought you saw like a little when she says worse than 2001, Larry, a little kind of Cheney-esque uh, snarl well, creep into well, the, the left side it, of her it, mouth. It's, but. Uh, I interpret it as here's this woman, she's under attack, the, the, the left hates her, her employer has abandoned her. Who does she have left? She has her base, her base of people who uh, use 9-11 as a talisman to ward off critiques of Bush administration policy. So you're conceding uh, that her it's base... Like, it's like saying never again. It's one of those emotional things that appeals to her base, and she's invoking it. And that's so what you're, it's, you're, not, it's not necessarily pro-Bush, it's pro-Judy Miller. She's, she's trying to rouse some sort of fan base that will buy her books and sustain her into her, her, uh, her senior years. So you concede that her base is the right? Well, duh. Well, no, but I mean, you know... Uh, Right-wing people are allowed to be reporters for the New York Times, too. Fine, but here's the distinction, Mickey. It's between being ideological and being partisan. Um, the, uh, you know, John Burns is, is a conservative, known to be conservative, New York Times reporter. But I've seen him interviewed many times, and he never gets into that mode. He is... He's reflective and detached, even though he's a conservative. He's not there to carry water for any particular political faction, and and, and he would not have answered that question. He would he would have he would have pondered the question of whether it's going to get worse or not. That was the question, and uh, that's the difference between him and Judy Miller. Every reporter has an ideology, and they're more often liberal than conservative. I admit, but Judy Miller is not just ideological; she's partisan, and oh, I think you, you see it in that flash of. Uh, of defensiveness. 
You could find partisan reporters on the other side. Of course you could, but they're not, you know, they're not the object of scrutiny right now. The, the question <laughs> hovering over Judy Miller is, is she merely ideological or is she partisan? No, the because, question because is... Because mere ideology would not get you to go to jail for Scooter Liddy. That, that's not the question. The question is... Uh, you know, did she screw up her? How badly did she? How bad a journalist is she? Did she, did she intentionally screw up her reports or, or negligently, no, no, or did she do nothing reports. wrong? I mean, I'm talking about the question uh, 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 surrounding the whole Libby indictment and her stay in jail prior to it. The question about whether she was motivated by this noble desire to defend, you know, the the, the, the sanctity of reporter sources, or whether, as many people believe, uh, she was. Uh, going going into the clinker uh, on on Libby's behalf, and well, I think only a partisan would do that. An ideological reporter like John Burns would not do that. Well, and I think she showed partisanship in this. Well, then why I don't I, I, I it's over determined. You could also be a First Amendment zealot trying to 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 follow you know Pinch Salzberger's ridiculous First Amendment crusade. You could, uh, so, and so it. You but could, so but what? then why would you change your mind and say well? Well, well, why would you change your mind if you were loyal to Scooter Libby? I mean, if you, well, she was really... Well, either way, the answer she, is she got tired of sleeping on concrete. But, but she also got, a, got assurances. And, I mean, look, you're the one who emphasized this. You were the first, I think, to emphasize this weird passage in Libby's letter to her, the interconnected roots of the Aspens. Well, I mean, is that code for saying we're all in this together or what? Well, I, I, just I, think, think, I, think, she, I think she may have been part of the, the uh, conspiracy to take us to war in Iraq. I don't think that's a, a, a very controversial... That's point. Not, that's not my point. I, I'm trying to illuminate her motivation in, in initially being willing to go to jail. But uh, anyway, I, 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 I think we're at loggerheads here. The um, I should, uh, for, for full disclosure, I should show the rest of that clip because then she pivots and, and 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 does the other the other half of the story about how some people are criticizing Bush. I maintain that it's pretty clear that what's going on is she realizes uh, in midstream that she's that she's showing her partisan roots. And she kind of struggles to say, on the other hand, some people believe this, and in fact, the, the, the rest is kind of not especially coherent, I'd say, and she's kind of treading water. Uh, let me go ahead and, and show people that and also give them another chance to see if, indeed, she adopts a Cheney-esque snarl when she says, worse than 2001, Larry? Okay, here it is. Is it going to get worse? Well, worse than what? Worse than 2001, Larry? Uh, it's continued. But al-Qaeda, without a doubt, I think, has been significantly weakened by the international war on terrorism that has been uh, led by this administration. Some people say uh, they haven't done a good enough job, but uh, al-Qaeda is still capable of striking out, as we saw, and as you pointed out in Jordan, that was a horrible attack, simply terrible. And I think that we as Americans and as people who care about uh, throughout the world about stability and democracy can't really pretend that the threat's going to go away anytime soon. Okay, but enough, enough about uh, that particular part of Plaingate. Um, you, have, you have a Plaingate issue? Well, there are a couple of Plaingate developments. Uh, just for the, I should have a, a safe get key for explaining Plaingate. Plaingate is the, the scandal as to whether the Bush administration uh, outed uh, the wife of a, of, of, of a critic in order to get back at him and whether that violated the law to out the, out the wife as a CIA agent. Uh, there have been a couple developments. Uh, I think the most important is uh, Tom McGuire of Just One Minute uh, came up with a, an old clip of Wilson talking right, you know, right around the time he wrote his famous op-ed piece this is criticizing the administration. Uh, and there has been talk on, on my side and, and others that, that Libby thinks uh, that a lot of critics of neocons and critics of the war are anti-Semitic. And, boy, Wilson uh, says something that really might have set uh, Libby off. Yeah, you steered me to that. I kind of scanned it quickly, but I didn't, <coughs> I, I didn't have time to look well, at it thoroughly. Well, so well, this, this read, is let's... Joseph Wilson, Plame's husband. And what is the worst thing he says? The worst thing he says is as follows. Uh, my fear is that when it becomes increasingly apparent that this was all done to make Sharon, as in Ariel Sharon's life, easier, and that American soldiers are dying in order to make Sharon's life, in order to enable Sharon to impose his terms upon the Palestinians, 
that people will wonder why it is American boys and girls are dying for Israel. And that will undercut a strategic relationship and a moral obligation that we've had towards Israel for 55 years. Uh, <clears throat> you know, that is the sort of thing that people who are prone to see anti-Semitism that sends them into orbit, uh, raising the issue of American boys dying for and, Israel. And, and who in particular is he accusing of having a dual allegiance or something? Well, he, 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 he talks about Richard Pearl and the, and the advice that Richard Pearl gave, okay, he's, he's gave not to about Israel. Living, right? He's talking about, in general, about neocons in the government, okay. of whom Libya is one. And uh, it's relevant because, A, it's sort of embarrassing to Wilson. I don't think the left will particularly want to Not defend. the first thing that's been embarrassing to Wilson, right. if you ask me. Uh, but. Se second, it, it, you know, it, it is, it's, it's both damning to Libya in that, you know, his defense is, I forgot all this stuff about Wilson. Well, if he, if he thinks he's a vicious anti-Semite, he's much less likely to have forgotten. It makes him seem like a little bit of a lone operator because... I think Libby had this, you know, my opponents are anti-Semitic bug more than, say, Karl Rove and other people in the administration had. On the other hand, when I thought about it after I wrote my blog item, it does make it a little more plausible that, you know, Libby and Cheney would decide this guy's really a bad guy, we really got to do him in. Uh, it makes him a, a little more likely to be guilty of the larger offense of trying to punish this guy by just destroying his life by outing his wife, which I've always thought was far-fetched and I still think is unlikely, but I no longer think is outside the bond, bounds of possibility. Uh, so the anyway. lone gunman scenario that you first entertained, or maybe McGuire first entertained, was that the, here we see how Libby could have been so exercised that he would have gone out and gone after Wilson without consulting with others in the administration. So it wouldn't have been a conspiracy. It's just him out freelancing. Right. And, and Libby was peculiarly obsessed with Wilson. He asked, you know, he monitored his video appearances in a way that, you know, Rove and the other people in the administration who uh, people on the left would like to see go to jail uh, would not have been obsessed. Mm -hmm. I don't know where Cheney fits in that. Uh, it's entirely possible Libby apprises Cheney of everything. It's entirely possible Libby doesn't. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, the second development there, there is that uh, this Time reporter was, was called to testify about her conversations with Rove's lawyer. Yeah, that seems to have baffled everyone, with the possible exception of true insiders like you. Do you have insight into that? Well, there are theories on... Uh, uh, on, on, on the go-to websites like Just One Minute and uh, Talk Left. Uh, the, one theory, for example, is that, uh, uh, you know, the, one of the things that the special prosecutor is going to go after Roe for is why did he take so long to reveal this conversation he had with Matt Cooper? Uh, and it was because he only revealed it after he had discovered an email. Uh, well, well, if... Novak talked to the lawyer about that conversation, you know, months and months before we discovered the email. Why did it take him so long? That's one question. And the second thing is, if Novak maybe tipped off the lawyer that, uh, that this Cooper was going to testify and had been subpoenaed, then the lawyer knows that Rove, uh-oh, he's about to get caught in a lie, I better change my story, which removes the defense of, oh, I honestly changed my story before it got me into tr before I learned I had to stay out of trouble. Uh, it makes Rove look much more guilty in changing his story, i.e., he only changed his story because he knew otherwise he was going to get caught, which means it's much more likely to charge him with perjury. So uh, it gets incredibly <laughs> involved, and there's a back and forth. I urge anybody who's uh, fascinated by this to go to Just One Minute or Talk Left or the sources cited therein. Well, do you think people like me can realistically... Hope to see Rove, uh, you know, frog marched off as Wilson uh, ill-advisedly hoped. I think now there's a uh, there's a you know greater than twenty, less than fifty percent chance. Hey, would be my guess. That's something. Uh, you know, there were, you could also get more than twenty percent of the people to to think that uh, you know Rove has lost his mojo and maybe it wouldn't hurt Bush to find somebody new. Hmm. But uh, uh, so those are the two developments. Uh, you know, I tend not to think that that what Wilson said was anti-Semitic. I think you, it's much better to raise these issues and hash them out and make Pearl and the other neocons say, look, you know, either we don't have dual loyalties or everybody has dual loyalties and 
our, our primary loyalty is the United States, and I think they could ably do that. And then, then the issue is not simmering, you know, on on right wing hate sites. Yeah, I mean, uh, I doubt there are many people who focus exclusively on America's national interest in the way they think about American foreign policy. I mean, it, it right. was common, you know, when NATO was was uh, being expanded to say, well. Uh, Clinton's doing it for Polish-American votes or something. And, of course, right. implied there is that Polish-Americans think about Poland's welfare when they think about American foreign policy. Right. Um, I, I assume Ted Kennedy, when he votes on things bearing on Ireland, is thinking a different way than I do. Um, right. Everybody has dual loyalties, and as as Leon Wieseltier said, why only two? Uh, we have triple loyalties and quadruple loyalties. That's life. Uh, you just have to deal with it. And discount for them, and it's perfectly reasonable to say, "Oh, you know, Clinton's just bombing this factory to get out from the Lewinsky subpoena." Well, that's a hidden motive. Let him let him respond. So, you think it is fair to talk about these motivations and speculate about them? I mean, it seems you should talk about all of them or take them all off the board. It seems like you should do, do one of the yeah. other. Yeah, no, no. I think you should talk about all of them, huh. uh, and I don't think you should hoot down. I don't think it's uh, a a accurate and b. Uh, Good for politics to to, sh to sort of brand anybody who raises them as anti-Semitic, but a lot of people disagree with me, and this is a pretty uh, hot button quote. Well, I will say whatever you think about this particular quote, Wilson has been a consistently annoying person <laughs> in this, from the standpoint of a partisan Democrat like myself, and has been the the main blemish on an otherwise thoroughly enjoyable scandal. So <laughs> you won't find me defending him. Um, cool. Uh, Walmart. Walmart. Uh, there's a very, uh, there's a good article by Sebastian Malaby in the Washington Post, uh, drawing on a study by Jason Furman, who's a very smart guy who worked in the Clinton administration. Uh, he claims Walmart's a great progressive force because of the savings it provides, especially to the poor, through its discount prices, vastly outweigh whatever depressing effect it has on the weight scale. Uh, and he makes a really good point, which is, all the everybody on the left is saying, well, General Motors, if only it could have the government to take care of its health care costs, it would be competitive. Yet when Walmart has the government take care of its health care costs by signing its employees up for Medicaid, uh, you know, liberals scream, oh, this is so horrible, they shouldn't do this. Well, a, which way is it? It's a good point, but it led me to realize something, which is that if we do enact universal health care, which I'm all for, it will actually reduce, relatively speaking, the incentive employers currently have to hire poor people because now they do get this implicit subsidy via Medicaid, which distinguishes the poor employee from other employees, which is strange. But, um, but they still have a, plenty of incentive to pay low wages, which tends to... Well, yeah, but the incentive them. will be reduced, and I wouldn't be against doing something to compensate for that. I, I mean, the, the, in a way... Malaby's argument is another example of the, what I think is a valid argument in free trade. You know, protectionists say, uh, say yes, free trade is good for consumers, but what about the workers? And you have to point out, wait a second, the workers are consumers, including the low-income workers, and they're getting the benefits that consumers get. Um, I, I went to Walmart the other day for the first time in a long time, and I needed to ask an employee for something. And I've got to say that as the Walmart critics insist she didn't seem like a happy camper first of all she was not she was not all that congenial she also i would say was not uh tremendously endowed with social skills did not seem well educated you might have looked at her and thought she was kind of uh borderline employable and i kind of went out there thinking well the walmart critics are right this is a terrible place but now i'm kind of thinking well truth is if they paid higher wages or were forced to or something, she's probably not the one they would have hired. Yeah. They would have gotten somebody slightly uh, up the scale on social skills and presumably do want people like her hired. So it just kind of reinforces the general idea that the, the, the best way to help poor people is to supplement uh, what the market does um, with things like earned income tax credit, health care, and so well, on. Th th that's the point I wanted to make. I mean, there's, there's sort of... There are two types of liberalism, and what the Walmart case uh, shows is that there are a lot of liberals who sort of want the benefits that, that, that I think should be provided by the government to be provided by corporations. I mean, my model is let the corporations make all the money they want. We know how to raise wages. The, the way is to run a really hot economy like we had in the last half of the 90s, wages right across the board. 
Walmart will have to pay more to attract workers. Nobody's going to go to work for Walmart when there's a better job down the street if it's so horrible. Uh, and if, if, if we need to subsidize the board, then give them the earned income tax credit. Let's give everybody health care. Uh, and let's have the government step in rather than impose some sort of obligation on corporations. Clearly, people on the left are unhappy with this model. You can see it with the living wage campaign. Well, partly because often it's not actually implemented. I mean, <laughs> we I don't think <laughs> I don't think that's why. I think it's because they are tied to unions, and unions uh, depend on no. The government doesn't provide this, these benefits. We are forcing corporations to be good citizens and provide them. Uh, that's the whole point of the living wage is we, they don't count the earned income tax credit. That's not – they want the wage itself to take people out of poverty. Neoliberals say, well, the wage plus the earned income tax credit takes people out of poverty. Uh, and the way they hope – the way the people who oppose that hope to do it is by unions. And it's sort of a, a whole – uh, corporate model. You know, why is it okay for the government to give health care to General Motors? Well, because they're helping the UAW, but Walmart doesn't have a union, so when the government helps them, all of a sudden Walmart is evil. Okay, well, I should say I have not seen the anti Walmart movie that recently played at our local Unitarian church, so it may be that I would be persuaded if thoroughly exposed to that side of it. And uh, I don't know, is it true that they still lock workers in at night and they die for lack of emergency medical care or something? Or is that. Um, if the jobs were that bad, people wouldn't take them. Do you think that's true? Well, I mean, I think, no, actually, there are some people who would take a job that had a very small risk of, uh, of that. And I do think the truth is we all buy into the idea that there should be some floor put under working conditions by the government. Right. Uh, but I, I just, I mean, my main feeling is kind of there's a lot, a lot bigger fish for the left to focus on than, than Walmart. Uh, but could be just me. Um, you know, I, 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 I see it as a result of their insidious dependence on unions for I kind of thought you might. financial muscle. Either that or their uh, insidious pro-immigration policy or their insidious anti-torture policy. Three, three things we can count on you to think about, which leads us a little circuitously to torture, right? That, that was a great segue. Thanks. I, you know, I don't think they'll even notice it. I mean, it's just, people are going to think this was totally spontaneous because it just glide, we just glide. We glide from one subject You're to another. You're supposed to notice it because we've divided the conversation up into discrete bite-sized blocks. Oh, they are. Yeah. We're supposed to know that they can, in fact, click on, independ on the individual topics that are to the right of the video box, which some people apparently don't know yet, but I'm sure they're learning. Um, yeah, torture. You directed my attention to this Charles Krauthammer a uh, piece on torture in the Weekly Standard. Needless to say, Charles is enthusiastically pro-torture. Uh, I have some things to say um, about uh, the, the piece. It struck me as kind of odd. You read it, right? Yeah, I read it. Okay. Uh, first of all, he says, now our conscience should be troubled by torture because here's my, my teleprompter's over here. Uh, he says, quote, uh, conscience would be troubled because there's no denying the monstrous evil that is any form of torture. Okay, so torture is a monstrous evil whenever yeah. you do it. I was struck by the, his overuse of the word monstrous, yes. <laughs> Not just that. No, this is more than a literary critique, Mickey. Um, then he goes on to give us a, 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 a thought experiment uh, in which uh, he says to not torture uh, the person would be a, quote, deeply immoral betrayal of a soldier or a countryman. Now, first of all, it seems to me strange to have a moral philosophy that forces you to choose between a monstrous evil and deeply immoral behavior. I mean, certainly a good moral system has to steer you through cases where something bad is going to happen no matter what you do. But as the terms evil and immoral are conventionally used, a coherent moral philosophy does not have you deciding between them, right? The, the moral thing, the good thing, is the kind of non-evil thing. Um, secondly, okay, granted, Charles wants us to have to face this choice between monstrous evil on the one hand and deeply immoral on the other, and he seems to think it's self-evident that you do the monstrously evil thing rather than the deeply immoral thing. I might have actually gone the other way. I mean, I think pretty much everyone has done something deeply immoral. I think I have. I don't think I've done anything monstrously evil. So kind of in my book, monstrous evil is, is, is up there in kind of Hitler land. Um, so that, that seems like a weird use uh, of, of vocabulary. But 
Further, when you look at the thought experiment where he's saying it would be deeply immoral not to torture the person, it is a case that involves uh, one, one person soldier. having been abducted, and not a civilian, right. but a soldier. A soldier has been abducted, you've got someone who knows where they are, and abducted by terrorists, so I guess you can, you can expect something bad to befall the soldier. It's deeply immoral not to torture that, that terrorist for, for the sake of one soldier. So we are talking about what I would call an extremely undiscerning policy of torture. I mean, we're talking about a lot of torture here. Right. You've, you've honed in on the weak spot of his argument. Uh, his I've honed in on the first two. I'm not done, but go ahead. No. Well, the, his article says we shouldn't torture except he proposes two exceptions, which seem quite sensible to me. One is the ticking time bomb case, and the second is where there's a high-level source like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed who knows a lot about a lot of other attacks that are planned that aren't necessarily ticking, but you want to know about them so you can stop them. But then he goes ahead and endorses torture and says we have an obligation in this in this situation that is neither of those two, sure. which is a lone soldier who is captured by terrorists, and do you torture somebody to find out where he is? Uh, and it seems to me he's stretched his exceptions so much that it, it, it casts doubt on whether he could be relied on to follow them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I say st stick to his original two exceptions, and you have a, a fairly sensible policy. And and the proof of that is, as he points out, that that's McCain's policy too. As as I think I mentioned a couple of, a couple of shows ago, McCain himself says in the ticking time bomb situation, "Well, you got to do what you got to do." And as anyone who who saw that show knows, I actually disagree with you on on the the case of the just just a high level terrorist who might know something example. Of course, we all kind of cave in the "if you could save Manhattan" example, uh, but 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 I, I question, you know, how often you're going to face that one. And I say, when you start getting down to smaller numbers, uh, certainly including one soldier, uh, which Krauthammer wants to torture for, I say definitely not. And in fact, I draw the line much much higher than that, which is a separate argument we should have sometime. Where where would you draw the line? But uh, another thing I found a little obnoxious about the piece is, you know. He says, in putting, in putting terrorists in a special category that warrants torture, he wouldn't, he wouldn't torture soldiers, but terrorists are different because, and of course they are different in some ways, but he says, a terrorist is an unlawful combatant. Why? Because he deliberately targets innocents. Well, Harry Truman, you know, killed about 100,000 innocents purposefully, knowingly, and I don't know if Krauthammer considers him uh, a terrorist. But more than that, he says, the terrorist, this is one of the reasons that the terrorist is... Uh, uh, outside the laws of war, okay? Now, the laws of war are part of, you know, international law or international norms. And I would just say Charles is pretty selective in when he pays attention to international law. According to mainstream international law, the invasion of Iraq was not a legal war, but I'm pretty sure uh, the crowd hammer was an enthusiastic uh, supporter of it. But it, a final thing that, that really bothered me about the piece is this gratuitous swipe he takes at the Quran where he's talking about uh, the, the Guantanamo prisoners, and he says, uh, you know, we've provided them with Qurans. He says that we should have provided those who kill innocents in the name of Islam with precisely the document that inspires their barbarism is a sign of the absurd lengths to which we often go in extending blah, blah, blah. Okay, one thing, I'm not sure that, that the best way to stem the rising tide of terrorism in the world is for a bunch of... Americans to go around dissing the Quran. I'm not sure that's in the national interest. Secondly, uh, you know, le leave aside the the question of to what extent the terrorism is actually inspired by the Quran, as opposed to various material circumstances, including some policies that people like Krauthammer support. Um, I would say anybody familiar with the Holy Bible should know that it has passages every bit as barbaric as anything in the Quran. Um, and it, it just seems to me like an argument we shouldn't start. And it, and it was just a completely gratuitous thing to bring into the article. And I've got to think it says something about Charles Krauthammer. I'll let you tell us what it is. Well, it's, what a bit is of, it? it's a bit of preening, and, and, and he also preens in, in his willingness to make the, the hard choices that all the intellectual weaklings are afraid to make. But he does make two good points in terms of, uh, you know, uh, puncturing the easy answers. One, the one easy answer is that torture never works. Uh, you know, John Stewart used that one just the other day. It's right, not, but it's, you've already punctured that and, in a much less obnoxious and, way. And the, and the second one is uh, that we, you know, we lay down these hard and fast rules that we should never torture. But then, 
even people like McCain make exceptions. So is it better, you know, the real debate is, is it better to codify the exceptions or to pronounce the blanket rule and then just be hypocritical if necessary? I, I think that's a, a legitimate argument, but, you know, McCain can't say, uh, oh, I'm cleaner than the driven snow because he tortured too in certain okay, circumstances. Okay, but given the fact that you've already said all these things, how did this piece move the ball forward? Uh, I, I don't think it moved the ball forward, except it moved the ball forward in the other direction, which is it forced Krauthammer to codify his exceptions to torture, uh, which sort of cabins him. Uh, it cabins him so much that he, some of his examples don't even fit into his two exceptions, and you can call him on that. So I thought it was uh, it, it sort of moved the ball uh, against torture, which I think is a good thing. Wait, uh, you're it, circumscribed the, the, it circumscribed the circumstances under which even Charles Krauthammer would sanction torture, and that's a good thing. It forced him to be clear on, on what the exceptions were, and they're you know, if you interpret them correctly, I think they're pretty narrow exceptions and pretty sensible exceptions. Wait, you mean the ones he's espousing? Yeah. Well, he's saying if you can save one soldier, you torture somebody. No, no, but I think that's... Uh, the, when he actually describes his two exceptions, uh, it's a high-level... He, he would have to include that as a ticking time bomb, and that's well, not right. a that's You think a that's a valid bomb. use of the ticking time bomb principle? Sorry? You think that's a valid extension? No, that's my point. My, okay. My point is... I that, misunderstood you. My point is that he is... It, incorrectly applying his principles in a way that could be turned back against him, which is why it's a good thing that he was forced to enunciate his principles because they limit the situations in which people like him can advocate torture, and that is progress, asymptotic progress toward agreement. I, I think he and McCain aren't that far apart by the end of his piece. They're, you know, they're well, again, though, it's, an impo it's important, even if you accept the ticking time bomb principle, where you draw the line, and on that, I agree. I think you got him on that one. They are worlds apart. I think you've got them on that one. Thank you. Okay. Uh, i got to put on my 399 Walmart hat, which I bought two years ago. It's incredibly warm. Yeah. Uh, and and it's it's why I like Walmart. I guess I'm a cheap lay. Cheap, That's not, cheap not lay. the one that makes you look like cheap a uh, KGB agent, is it? I think it is. Is it? It's hot. The, the, it's very attractive. Yeah. Okay. It, okay, well, good. Um, it makes me look like an extra in a Mike Myers movie about the Great White North. Yeah, I, I, I needed that elaboration. In fact, I need a little more, but I don't think we have time for all the elaboration I need on that illusion. Okay. Um, it's been real. See ya. See you around. Bye.